So hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the Snap and Senior Presentations. Uh, my name is Nathaniel and I've started presentations uh, with my own development in the past four years, which I um, not necessarily as a title of presentation, just something that I'm thinking about that really does embody um, the past four years of my work here at Tufts. Uh, and I'm currently calling it the ethics of ethnography. Um, so ethnography is a term used in social sciences, meaning it's a form of research or methodology of research based on talking to people uh, through conversation and through interview. Um, and so I'll tell you a little bit about how I got here and what I mean by the ethics, especially of ethnography. Um, and ultimately, this application uh, of ethnography and of what I'm talking about is a relation to medicine or care or illness and in health. Um, that's something that's guided me in the past four years. So especially, why do stories and the way that we tell stories matter in medicine and in how we provide care? So my freshman year, um, I piloted this uh, campaign called Take What You Need Campaign. I started it here at Tufts, and then I went to Boston and to certain art sites and was um, hosting and uh, plastering um, these posters. Um, and so two things that are important here are the types of things that I'm, um, one is the types of things I was asking people to talk about or to take. Um, so I was um, having those and leaving them sort of with Terry Strip. They'd walk by, they'd see it maybe, they'd think about it, they'd grab something. Um, and the ones that were always taken were forgiveness uh, and confidence. Um, and the second thing that I want to know is the name that's take what you need. So it's taking. You know, but what I realized how to do this project, so it worked really well. People were taking tabs. Um, I never talked to people in the stories. I watch and sit, post, and like sit for six hours somewhere and watch people come by and like, grab stuff. But I would never engage with people. Um, and the first thing I learned about this was that I didn't do anything meaningful. So I would ask people to stop and interact, to stop and do something with their time, to think about what they need. And I was seeking information about them, but I was never doing anything with that. And I think that. As I, moved, as I started moving on, I kind of felt like that. I never knew what the next step of this project was. I just knew that I was asking people to reveal something about themselves, right? To publicly say, like, I need forgiveness in my life. I need confidence in my life. I need to say that publicly meant something. And I said, how do I take this seriously? And so I put that in the back burner. So th this was a campaign for my freshman year. Uh, and I was inspired, um, I think it was by Allison, um, by another skeptic, who loves taking photos, and I said, what do you do with that? And she writes about it. She, she, she's highlighting it, she wants to think about the space that you're occupying. And I said, in a very similar way, I did this. But I was asking and taking information from people. So I want to leave this slide thinking about the idea of taking information. Then our sophomore year, we worked uh, together to try and put on a collection of talks, which we called Fireside Chats. One of them was with a professor who was obsessed with death, um, and her own death, and her own mortality. Uh, so I would talk with death among her friends. Uh, and this was the first time I said then, like, if I take information, how about we make, it's a collection of people in conversation with each other. That was the whole goal, was that it was not someone talking at someone, uh, but it was sharing information, right? So it's not, it was no longer about taking away, or just taking notes, or taking observations about other people, but people collectively making something together. Um, which I really, really appreciate. I started to, I started to think about this. So parallel to this time, um, I started taking medical anthropology. Uh, anthropology is the discipline, is the study of humans, and everything that humans do, anything can be anthropology, but specifically medical anthropology. And I wrote a, um, I wrote an illness narrative, which is not, it wasn't a paper, but it was asking to talk to my aunt about uh, illness. And in her life, uh, we talked about insomnia and the inability to sleep, and what that meant as a mother. So she told me the story of, before she was a mother, she remembers sleeping really, really well. She slept deep, uh, and she felt refreshed in the morning. But the moment she became a mother, any cry in the night woke her up. That seems biologically necessary. Like, if your baby's crying, there's something probably wrong, you go. Um, normally, though, you lose that over time. Like once your parents, once you get older, once your, your, your kid is in their 20s, 30s, you probably biologically stop. There's a biological mechanism that is supposed to make you need or to, to, to sleep a little bit deeper. And she lacks that. So she talked to her doctor, and the only way that she could sleep was on medication. And what happens is that she, her brain like blacks out. So there's no dreaming. From, it's like her brain just shuts down, and she gets sleep. So she's physically rested every morning, but she's emotionally not satisfied. She still is exhausted emotionally. And so in conversation with this, I started to think about what is the dialogue. So then I started these conversations though by asking her, having learned my lesson from this, asking her very seriously, what do you want to get out of talking? 
this was an assignment for class, so I wanted the information from her, but there was an ethic of saying, what am I supposed to do with this information? And I encourage you in your lives as you move forward to ask that as well, of the communities that you work with, not to take, but also to give back something. And hers was, I want a better understanding of, of myself. Am I weird for doing this? I want to understand, is there an alternative treatment? So that's how we went about that. Oh, so that was another project. Uh, so around this time, I moved, uh, I, I, I took my first real internship when I was working at the South Bend Community Health Center. Um, I was really interested in women's health at the time, and so I worked in mammography. Um, the way that South Bend takes care of this is that, at, so A, as a federally qualified health center, most of their patients are low income. Um, specific, specific to the center, uh, most of them were, most patients were Spanish speaking, and I'll show a slide about that in a second. Um, but how they have their patients get screened is that uh, a digital um, mammography technology comes to the center on a mammography van, um, and people get screened there at, at the center itself. Um, the benefits were that people didn't have to waste time transport, being transported into the city. Um, but the problem with the center is that they had alarmingly low rates. They had an, a failing rating, uh, and they were not they were going to lose funding if they didn't do something about it. And so. Instead of asking the physicians or asking anyone else, I just said, I went straight to patients. I went to the patient records, literally called patients and said, hi, you had an appointment. Why did you miss it? And my favorite answer was, I didn't know I had an appointment. That's kind of weird, right? You probably would know if you had a medical appointment. That makes sense, right? That's like the only thing you need to know is when and where it's at. Um, and so I figured this out. Uh, wow, none of the numbers transferred. Anyways, the biggest one is that 68% of, uh, of their patient population spoke Spanish as either their first language or as their, uh, as their only language. Um, and so the way that rep referrals are made, so the way that you book an appointment for uh, screening mammogram still is that the doctor says you need it, you go outside to a patient coordinator, they acknowledge that you need it, they collect your information about when you're available, they'll call a hospital or the services that deliver the mammogram, they'll book an appointment, that person will call you back, leave a message, and assume that you get to the appointment. That's four calls. Most of Boston services are offered in English. When your primary language is, in, is Spanish, but that's like a logistical breakdown. But I thought about this in two ways. When I was calling women I, in the chart, it tells you what their primary language is. Um, and so I called them and I asked, why are you missing, right? I, 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 started, I started, the very first question is, hi, you had an appointment, and then the first question I asked is, why did you miss your appointment? I didn't say, I, 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 it was, I tried to be a little bit more open-ended about this. And what I realized is that if you let people tell you other things that they said were, I don't feel comfortable searching for cancer, I don't like that idea. Like in my community, I feel like I'm looking, for, I'm looking for cancer, I'm looking for bad news. Or, it sounds really expensive and painful and scary. I know from my sister and my aunt that I don't like it, it's uncomfortable. Or, I can't really afford that right now, even though a mammogram is covered by most insurances. And what I learned was that, for the Spanish, for what, what shifted in my mind then was how do you articulate to your provider what you need when you can't communicate? How do you tell your own story? How, before, yeah, I understand I need a mammogram, but I can't take time off work, or I don't feel comfortable getting screened, or I can't physically afford that, or you can't. And so language as a, as a lens, not just as the logistics of speaking, but how do you tell to the world what you need and what you want? So, Ethnography, if based on, on a interview, is about conversation and dialogue, you need language. Um, and so I moved on one more step. Uh, and I started working for Dana-Farber itself. So Dana-Farber uh, was, was the company that was bringing the technology to these community health centers. And I said, more broadly then, how do we talk about healthcare in general? And how do we talk about stories in healthcare? And so what we ultimately realized is, in Boston, Boston does a pretty good job at screening people. Overall, the, the citywide screening rate is somewhere between 83 and 88 percent, depending on the racial demographic, which beats the national average of 60 something, 69 to 72 percent Rosenthal et al. Um, I can cite that because I just published or I'm publishing right now on that. Um, so 69 to 72 percent of, uh, depending on the study, depending on the year, is the national average for screening. So Boston's doing a pretty pretty good job, right? But what about the 80? So of the 88% of the are being screened, 12% are not being screened, how do we reach that? What's happening in Boston that leaves us needing more outreach there? And so that Dana Farber, I took all these stories that were really meaningful to me in my own personal life, 
I took stories that I learned in class, I talked, the way we talk about stories, the way we tell stories, the way we frame stories, and I applied it here at Dana Farber. What we decided to do was to make a training program based on community members. That it was, rather than us saying, you need to get screened, and me going to a community center, like exactly here, and saying, hi, let me tell you about why you should get screened for breast cancer. We started a training program that tells women, or that gave women the tools and the knowledge and the skills and the practice to go out and do that themselves. Um, so I realized if you told, if you let people tell tell you what they need rather than telling people what they need, you're going to do a lot better job at outreach. Um, and so that's where we are right now in my, in my professional life is uh, we're working on designing these trainings. Um, but remember the story. Of this was ethics, ethics of ethnography. Why? So why? How do these stories matter in medicine, and why? Why should they matter? And this takes me to the next chapter. So. Uh, parallel to my time being a farmer, I started working on my own senior capstone, um, and it's titled How to Eat Jack Group on Growing Up Vietnamese American and Queer. And so, to better understand my own history as a Vietnamese American person, uh, I started to ask the family members, I asked them stories. Um, and what I, but keeping in mind what I was about to ask, I asked people what they were willing and comfortable to share and what they wanted me to do with it. So, I'll share two stories from this book. So the first story is about my parents. My parents are uh, were born in Vietnam. Uh, my dad from the countryside then moved to a big city. His father joined the military, and that's eventually his connection how he got to the United States. My mom was born in, in the city of Saigon. She lived there all in, in, until she was 15. She left Vietnam when she was 15 and arrived in the United States. That's what I know. That's basically what I knew about my family before I talked to them too much about this. Uh, my dad tells me he left um, on a plain, um, he is the child of a colonel, and so they were taken, so Americans were willing to help and airlift him out, and he came here with his brother. Um, do you guys have any questions, or any? Can you tell us about what you're going to do now? Where are you going to go? Uh, yes, so I'm, I am thinking about two things right now in my life, uh, big, two big idea clusters, uh, and how, I'll, how you move through them in the world. So one question is about diaspora, uh, and what that means. So in relation to my capstone I just finished, the new question I'm asking is, are my parents part of the diaspora? Now, does anyone have a definition for diaspora so far? Or when you use, how, do you, how would you use diaspora? If you were to use it in a paper or in a sentence, any of you of? Yeah? A group of people who don't live in their place of origin. Correct. That's, well, that's one very correct answer, uh, and that's the way that I took it. But I had not been told that as, as uh, in school. So, up until the age of 22, I had never used the word diaspora. I had never said it out loud, nor had I written it in a paper. I had, I had read it, and I had only read it, but I had never said it out loud, and I had never written it in a paper. It had only ever been said to me in the context of slavery to be taken out from your home and to drop somewhere. So I looked up the origins of the word diaspora, and it comes from dia and sperin, from the Greek meaning across and spread, to be spread across the world. It, there are no indications of whether you're taken or you're forced out. Um, so I thought about the context of my parents, and so I'm trying to think more critically about this uh, in my own personal writing. You know, so this is one of the two projects that I'm doing in my life. Is for my parents who are, my mom went to a French school and spoke French, English, and Vietnamese. She was let, uh, and her father worked for an American company. So her ability to come to the United States was predicated on the fact that she would assimilate, and that she was best or most likely most socially capital, or had the most social capital to offer out of. 11 million people in the country, like why her, why her family? And my father is the son of a colonel, also very well educated. So, them leaving, or be, them being political refugees is one way to articulate that, but they also they had the choice to not, to not leave. There were, and I have other families or members who chose to not leave, but that choice to not leave is not always choice, that choice is sometimes damnation or condemnation uh, and being condemned, so what does that mean? So it, are, what does diaspora mean to my parents in a big context? Um, and their choice or inability to choose their age at the time. And then my relationship to that is that, is Vietnam my home or is the United States my home? Do I have a, another place that I can go home to? And right now, in this moment, I say nationally, and I've only ever known myself as American. Um, and so that relationship. So that's one, one thing in my writing that I'm talking about. And I hope to understand that a little bit better um, when, I, when I start reading and going around. Um, the other big work of uh, going to PhD program, I am a medical anthropologist, uh, or I train here at Tufts and what I go into later on. Um, and that is on how 
So right now it's kind of two pronged. One prong is on. Um, so in 2013 and 14. Uh, Argentina passed legislation that made IVF available to everyone and free to the state, regardless of sexual orientation or marital status. And so a happy, healthy home um, as a gay or queer person in Argentina, regardless of the two factors, is what? You have a child. You probably have a partner and a child. That's great for Argentina. Um, but what about the opposite side of that? So I, as, as I began reading about this and doing preliminary research, I also learned that for mental health diagnoses, uh, certain mental uh, so certain mental health diagnoses preclude you from being allowed to have IVF treatments performed, so that you can't have families. What is IVF? Uh, in vitro fertilization, sorry. Um, so, or, or any of these assisted reproductive technologies, but uh, it precludes you from getting the benefits of the state. So the state won't sponsor you if you have certain diagnoses. They won't allow you to have this right. That's uh, constitutionally allowed in their constitution. Um, and so what does that look like for a person, and let me clarify that, Mental health diagnoses are disproportionate among LGBT communities, but also disproportionate among people of color. And how, when you overlap those two, what does that look like? Uh, in the context of our team, it gets a little bit complicated, but I'm looking at people who are at fringes who live on the opposite side of that thing, who are constrained and or withdrawn or reclusive, either by themselves or by structures that are put on them, in, um, and how they navigate that. Um, so yeah, uh, next year I'll be going to a PhD and PH program uh, at Rice University in medical anthropology, uh, and I'm taking a leave of absence to do some research in Argentina. So, all right. But thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank, thank you so much for being here. Uh, yeah, let me see if I can do the clicking somewhere. Okay. Yeah, I'll try to. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kian, and I'm presenting my uh, senior final presentation. It's one of those things that I. Uh, got to do for fun and I, uh, I'm really excited to share with you. I titled it Playing With Boundaries. It's from one of the lines that I really enjoy. Uh, don't play within boundaries, play with boundaries. And uh, I also subtitled it Queen 201. I think it's an advanced version of, uh, of what it means to be like me. <laughs> uh, so, so I know you're not, not in for a lecture, but uh, maybe you can try to make a lecture fun. So this is a game plan. Uh, uh, this is my hope for you. Uh, first, I hope that you think I'm crazy. This should be easy. You should believe that I'm crazy is cool. Uh, it should inspire you to be a little bit crazier. Should, that's harder and then uh, hopefully, I hope that uh, you leave it, uh, leave today feeling that you are living a bit more importantly. Um, and also being a, being a sign guy, I would like to start with a good definition. So uh, this is, uh, I, should, I should define the term crazy. It's then uh, one is being in a way that you cannot imagine yourself being. That's uh, my definition number one. And then two is making your shell shut your head in disbelief. So uh, that's also another definition of crazy. Uh, so let's see. Uh, keep that in mind, you see even how far you go into this game. Um, so you gotta do the job. Um, so, on paper, uh, I came to talk four years ago with a plan to be computer science and philosophy major. I really got into uh, the first intro class in comp science and philosophy, got really into it. Um, and then as you can see on the right side, this is an a image that one of my close friends drew for me. If you speak a bit of computer science language, it's, uh, it just means queen point, right? Like, you know, I'm becoming more like myself, my point is ending up. <laughs> Uh, it's an okay. infinite loop in computer science. Uh, that very much captured who I was four years ago, three years ago, three years ago, maybe different now. Uh, now I'm a computer science student on paper, and uh, I tell people that I do philosophy. I don't have qualification, I don't really care. Nobody asks. Nobody asks. Wait, but I have two years. Okay, so on Ludo, uh, this is how I uh, describe myself. Uh, a part of me is a creative guy. Um, and I try to ask myself the question, what wants to be born from inside? And then the other side of me, the change maker guy, um, what needs to be created in the world? And uh, very much of a trying to do things in the world. But you know, all in all, I've been thinking about that for a long time, and that I'm very much of a quester. 
and that's why you know, I use games and all that because I'm a huge gamer at heart. Still very much a gamer. I don't play video games anymore, but I play the games of life. <laughs> uh, and I'm keep, I hope I'm, I'm leveling up. So that's, uh, that's my. Uh, so this is an example of uh, my uh, side project, uh, my creative side. I uh, wrote a weekly digest. I've been doing it for about two and a half years, almost three years now. Uh, start with sophomore year. Some of you are there. Some of you are not there yet. I uh, <laughs> encourage you to check it out. Every week I send out a newsletter with a bunch of uh, thoughts, and usually it's quite. People have said it's quite thought provoking. People overseas also said it's a good way to keep in touch with, with me and what's happening. And it has been going very well, and I'm very happy to the people who, who have been part of it. Um, so that is an example of uh, creative side. and the other stuff? Um, this is uh, on the change making side. Uh, this is a collaboration project with a, one, a few good people. One of them is Judy, who's here. Uh, Open Call. We started in the last November. It's a community experiment, <coughs> and bringing a lot of people from different places uh, on campus to be together in Downing Hall um, to, uh, to form meaningful connection through shared novel experience. And we have had 17 events so far every week. Some of you have been there, you know. It's, uh, it's kind of hard to describe. <laughs> uh, but, but usually, like, you know, people usually live through it like they have made some kind of connection with people, which is really nice. Um, so uh, beautiful space, beautiful people, very, uh, something that I'm quite proud of. Um, along the line of uh, making change and bringing people together, something that I really love. A uh, project recently I did with a few friends, uh, bringing together friends, uh, people from different perspectives, uh, especially in a time where we found that there's a lot of polarizing opinions on campus and in the world. Um, our effort to bring people together was, uh, uh, we thought it was a very important work needs to be done, and we did it. Uh, I think some of you might have been there, and uh, uh, we hope that the impact has, uh, is starting to spread and we're going to continue it next year. So that's a few examples of the project. I don't really want to go too much in my project because uh, I think the learnings that come out of it from my journey actually, I think, will be more relevant to you all. So, um, so I'm going to talk about uh, just a bunch of fail failures that I have over the past four years. I've you quite a lot. I do have a lot of, I, I try a lot of stuff and I do feel a lot. As you can see, we, I, I break down into a few categories. Uh, failure, and, failure and heartbreaks. Uh, failure in class, failure in clubs, failure in work, failure in relationship, failure in my own expectation. There's a lot of failures and I can go into one, one by one to share with you a bit more insight about what they are and what I have learned. So, first is uh, failure in class. Um, I have been uh, one of my. I've grown up thinking that I'm a good student, and I, you know, it's a very useful and important identity to the point where, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, we are still students and we want to be good students. And realizing that's no longer enough uh, to be a citizen in the world, if you keep the mindset of being a good student, what does that even mean? You need to get good grades, you need to satisfy the professor. And um, I thought that was just. Uh, not really, that is playing within the boundary. Like the boundary is at the good student and you play within it. Right? That's not cool. Um, so I, I decided to play with the boundary and try and test my own boundary, what it felt like to not be a good student anymore. So I tried to fail class. Um, and I very intentionally fail. It's not like I'm too busy that I fail the class. It's like I have some time, but I'm like, try not to do it. Because I just have to see how I felt. So I um, it was one of my uh, one of my class last semester, COP 105. Uh, it's a very tough class in the CS department, computer science department, and I uh, I, I posted. This, I, I did not do the, the the class very well. I did not do a lot of assignment, and I posted to the uh, Facebook group telling everyone that I did not do the assignment, uh, and I told the professor that I did not do it because you know I just wanted to test my own. Yeah. And I wrote a story out of it, it's called Learning by Not Doing. I highly you guys check it out, I think it's very valuable experience. If you have not done it in your tough time, try not doing the assignment because you just don't, you just want to see how it felt. That's an important experience for us. Very tough for me. Um, it was so, so, so hard. Like, I'm somewhat of a type A guy, I, I, I want to do this and then I can't even relax. 
Uh, so uh, I learned a few things from this experience. One, you have to create your own safety net. You know, you can fail a class, but you're still fine and get through it. So have that safety net, understand it. Two, explore the boundaries and test very wisely. Um, you know, you can, experiment can fail with the experimental. It doesn't fail. Um, so test wisely. One of the biggest experiments I've done in Tufts. I really highly recommend those who still have a few years happening. If you ever feel like your major is not for you, take a semester if you can afford. Think, think about it in advance. Uh, take a semester totally not doing anything in your major at all. And uh, see how you feel. I did that in my junior fall. I told myself, if I'm not doing any philosophy, I'm not doing any computer science, I'm going to see if I miss either of them. Mm -hmm. If I do miss them, that means that, you know, I care about them. Uh, but if I not, then just forget it. And I did not miss neither, uh, yeah, my, I missed neither of them. <laughs> so, I, you know, coming out, I swear it was very tough. Like, wow, I'm not doing anything. Uh, it was very hard, but I learned that I, uh, I could take it and I didn't really care. And so I can continue living with a lot more, uh, more relaxation and also more sense of purpose. I know what I want to do, uh, which is not computer science philosophy. Mm -hmm. So that was a helpful test. Not easy, uh, but yeah, very important to move beyond the good student mindset to uh, the lifelong learner mindset, going beyond the grades, going beyond expectation of professor and society, whatever. I think is really important uh, to test that. Um, and then uh, we can look at uh, my other film clubs. Uh, I've also failed a lot. Um, here's one example. Uh, sophomore year, I uh, ran this club called Compass Fellowship. I was a fellow in my freshman years. And um, it's a group for students interested in entrepreneurship, social impact, mentorship. And uh, I was very young at the time I took on the club. I had a team. We worked together kind of well, but uh, it's hard. And uh, you know, running a club is like, oh my gosh. Managing people is hard, and this is one of my earlier experience feeling the pain of dealing with people. It's hard to, to get people in the same room, get the same time, get people care. Uh, it's so hard. Um, and so uh, we decided to uh, cure it, and uh, some of my learning from the experience, I could talk more, I've reflected a lot on it. I think number one lesson I've learned is to have the courage to kill the baby. If you have to. It's, it's tough. Uh, sometimes you have to do it, just kill it. Um, and then the second lesson I learned is that I, I, I am actually someone who cares a lot about people and so it's very hard for me to work with people and then realizing that not, they are not doing well and I not care too much about one or two people and forgot about the whole project and the rest of the team. Um, and I learned I go out from caring too much and um, uh, um, I learned that lesson, cannot care too much about one or two people, sometimes I have to let some people go and move on. A uh, big lesson, very important. Um, fail at work, this is probably uh, one of the more epic fail. More epic fail. This is a, a letter, an email I received from a boss, my boss two summers ago in, uh, in uh, the Bay Area. So as you can read, um, it's a 2000 word email. I got it on Thursday night on July, uh, July, July 28th. Uh, just two days before I came, uh, went home. <laughs> That was uh, rough. Uh, the design of the workshop was incredibly weak. So um, I got bad feedback. I cried that night, cried a bit again in the morning. Uh, <laughs> took a while to really breathe through that pain. Um, I don't know, it might, it might happen to you guys. I told myself it might happen to me in the future. You might as well have it now. Uh, example number two, the last summer of my boss number two. Uh, Mom, from my perspective, you have a great deal of underused potential. We have with your habits and continue to hold you back. Because the way you naturally operate makes you awkward and unwieldy for other people to interact with. Um, and then you guys, you were not a summer intern at Community Tech, I would have stopped paying you after the first one or two weeks and told you it wasn't working out. So she was very nice in telling me that I could have been fired. I could have been fired. So, um, uh, you know, I, I usually have a reasonable self-esteem uh, and every time this kind of thing happens, I just have to like, take a deep breath. <laughs> and uh, this time I didn't cry, I actually talked to the person. So I like, was very emotionally stable listening to this. 
Uh, and then, you know, I appreciate that my boss is awesome. It's, what it's, like. uh, it's hard, though. Um, so, a few lessons learned. Um, growing up equals uh, living with the consequences of my, of my own action, you know, things that I did, and then now this is the shit that I have to bear. And this is real world, this is professional world. And I've got feedback, and I'm learning from it. And um, yeah, I feel pretty confident about that now. And my boss actually, this boss actually told me that she had a lot of respect for me as a learner. I do have a lot of resilience. So um, that's a bonus point. Uh, lesson number two, cry if you have to. Learn and move on. Uh, I did cry. It's tough. Uh, then you have to learn and move on. Uh, and then the last lesson I think is really important that usually we forget. I usually hear people after summer saying things about the internship, but then there's no, not much relevant to their school life anymore. And to me, that's not the case. I love like being in the summer, seeing people, how they make things happen, how they run meetings, how they facilitate. And I learned a lot. I brought so much of that back to where I am today, senior year, running club, running group, organizing, building teams, uh, so much of that. Um, so very valuable learning. Uh, so much that uh, working together was so hard that I had to write up a kind of a manual on how to make the most of it clean. And I put it online, I, put, I sent it to my bosses and I sent it to my future boss just a few days ago. And, um, so I hope this convinced you uh, that I'm kind of crazy. Uh, but actually it works. And being a, it's very scary, very vulnerable to put myself out there and tell people that this is how I work. And I'm not telling them unless you have to bend for me. But you should know that is how I work. We're so hard to work together. And like, you all know that it's so hard. The people are so, so complex. I try my best to make myself understandable. Um, uh, hopefully that convinces you that uh, being crazy is, could be useful and cool. Uh, you can find it online and say it after. It's uh, version 1.25 now. Uh, um, so fail number three, relationship. I fail also several relationships. I can't go into too much detail, but I can share some of the learnings. Um, uh, uh, learning number one, this is exactly what I've said a few times to people. You have said no to my proposal, not to me as a person. I do that, I say that, and you know, I still keep that in my heart. Like, it, it's true. Learning to separate the, the, the person from the action is a very important skill and being separate, able to separate ourselves with our own action too. Uh, yeah, emphasize number two, cry if you have to, learn and move on. Uh, useful lesson, uh, you know, big boys do cry, small boys also cry, everyone always cry. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and then the last lesson is, yeah, this is like, I'm telling you in a very tricky way, but it works and it's very important is to be kind with everyone. Uh, including especially yourself. And this is very hard, especially when it comes to tricky emotional stuff and life stuff. Um, I'm, I'm like, being very quick with all this inside here to just give you a sense where you can always talk after if you want. Um, and the last failure that I think is really the most important failure that I keep failing all the time, trying to learn from it, is failing to keep up with my own expectation. Uh, I think uh, we have a lot of expectations for ourselves. I do have some exception to myself, and I usually don't need them. And so how I deal with them, uh, uh, I have two things that I keep in mind all the time. Uh, two quotes by Peter Drucker, a personal hero of mine, very well-known author. Uh, one, a person grows according to the demands he makes on himself, according to what he considers as achievement and attainment. <coughs> and this is relevant to what I said about playing with your own boundary, and you have to be able. I, I learn to set my own boundaries of what I count as meaningful, as achievement, as success. And then I make demands, can listen to the world at the same time, being able to come up with my own definition. Uh, that was not easy. Uh, it has helped me a lot in terms of how I feel about working and being in life. And the second one is do not try to change yourself, but work and work hard to improve the way you perform. Uh, it's very hard. I think most of us just think that we have we have to be well rounded, we have the weakness, we have to fix the weakness, which is true. At the same time being able to remember that we have 
certain way of doing things that have become our own strength and learning to use them. Um, very important. Um, so with that, I wanted to share um, kind of a personal thing, personal like uh, issue. Right? You know, being a synaptic scholar is not just about the thing you do in the world, also what goes on in your internal life. Um, I would say my tough journey has been uh, kind of overcoming and embracing and now celebrating my own insecurity. We all have insecurities. Uh, I, don't, I wouldn't say I'm more secure right now, I'm just saying that mm -hmm. I think I'm a lot more comfortable being insecure. I just tell people that I'm not really good. Mm -hmm. uh, so what happened when it came to tops in sophomore year, freshman and sophomore year, had that feeling of like, having a lot of ideas in the world and I wanted to do a lot of things in life. And this feeling that I'm not enough to the task and uh, that is kind of a crippling sense of insecurity. Uh, it took me a long journey to uh, move to uh, 2015, one of the biggest transformations that I've had is this new motto that two phrases of the first part is Amina, uh, which is not easy to remember sometimes. And I can be more, um, which is something that is being able to uphold both phrases at the same time, it's, it's not easy. Uh, that's 2015 for me. Um, 2016, I'm kind of going to uh, uh, upward uh, uh, wave and so feeling that I'm enough and I will be a lot more and I'm actually doing a lot more in 2016, reaching out to the world doing more stuff, uh, getting more involved more and more. And um, 2017, I think for me, is uh, <laughs> life is a massage. <laughs> 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 This, this, this needs some explanation. Because uh, I don't like you think I'm too crazy. Uh, um, so, you know, you've seen like, a lot of things that happen to me, right? I'm uh, failures and all that. And uh, one thing I'm trying to think about life these days is that life is a massage. And they're different kind of massage. They are like, they are, like uh, the normal, like very nice massage uh, that you feel good. And there's like, the right key, which is you felt super light. You don't even feel anything. The magic and there's Thai massage just like breaking your bones, <laughs> <laughs> but they're all massage and you know you, you be able to breathe through it actually felt pretty really good. Uh, so I, I I'm uh, using that as a motto in my life. I wanted to share that. I hope that it'll be useful for you uh, when you go to massage. Also when you live through life, uh, just think of everything as a massage. So, uh, it could hurt a bit uh, uh, and could be really nice. So so. Uh, that's our internal more like our internal journey. Uh, and then uh, speaking of I will be a lot more and uh, inspiring you to be a bit crazier. This is uh, another example of how crazy I am. I do a bit of, I do quite a lot of like, personal mapping stuff. I love this and I'm sharing with you guys. Yeah, I have ideas of like, here who I am, here the people I want to be, here the skill I want to learn, this how, how I'm going to improve it, this how I'm going to get more practice. So I'm like, really crazy about all these things. Um, and you know, I learn because I'm just someone who enjoys it, but I also learn that most of these are just concepts that you can, you will change over time, and uh, life is definitely not represented through these simple maps. Um, so, I wanted to share a few larger learnings that I got over the past four years in Tufts. Um, uh, and number one about people, uh, learn to expect very little of people, because uh, otherwise you get heartbreaks too often. Uh, but then, you know, anyone who go beyond that little s s low bar, just really cherish them and, and, you know, I love all the people in my life. Cherish the people uh, who go beyond that low bar. Uh, <laughs> um, we live in the better side, uh, we just have to. There's no reason to, seriously, there's no reason to. I don't know, I just try my best to do that every day and be surprised. Uh, they usually go together very well. Uh, in relationships, never burn bridges. I have learned from my experience, not so much of a negative one, mostly positive one. Don't burn bridges. Even to my bosses who said like that kind of thing to me, I still like, say thank you not for once in a while, once I felt like i kind of grown up from that. Still say thank you, never burn bridges. And uh, share vulnerability, really, really important concept. Um, as I was writing, like making this, uh, slide I was thinking too, like, who am I to say this? <coughs> it's a very common mindset, like, who am I to say this? Those are seemingly wise things. 
Um, then I, and then I, I, I thought, that, wait, who are you? Like, who is that boy that say that you cannot say this? <laughs> <laughs> and then so, you know, that, that, that's, that's the whole point, is that there's always that voice in our head, and it's just being aware that there's a voice. Um, and do it anyway. So our relationship, our own life, uh, nothing ever really dies very relevant to memorable images. I think the question I've been asking myself this day is how do I turn what people call shit into fertilizer? <laughs> how do we look at the, some, something that people throw away, people, people, a society throw away? I really want to make a difference and all that. And so this is the model that I came up with over the years and heard about uh, and also reflected on my experience. Is that we? Uh, I came with an idea that I want to make an impact, and then some of you might be that person, or you know someone who said, "I want to be make an impact, make a difference." So you started out with an impact, one thing to make an impact, and then uh, once you have like one thing to make an impact, you have a project in mind, you have different project you want to do stuff, um, and then once you got a project, you find the people that you want to work with, and then start working on it. And then you carry out the project, you go to the experience, and you experience the kind of uh, internal transformation. You do work in the world, and we just realize that we are not really there to change the world, it's actually be there to be changed, to be touched by life, to be touched by the people that we try to serve. Um, and so, so that's an experience that many of you might have had, and I had myself, and I realized that after that, it's actually not about changing the world, it's actually about being changed. Um, and so, what I'm realizing from my own life here, and what I'm doing in the future is actually after that internal transformation, becoming a different person. Uh, I became a different person, maybe more, more carefree, more cheerful, wanting to do stuff, but not really caring too much about the results. And uh, by becoming a more cheerful guy, which is that internal sense of joy. I got to meet more people who are all kind of people who are doing all sort of cool stuff. And they're all like great folks. And then I was just meeting these people, you get a lot of like thoughts and ideas. And then with all these thoughts and ideas, and like, you can actually start doing a lot of cool stuff. Uh, <laughs> you a better person, not even without trying. Uh, and this is actually what I wanted to share with the synaptic group, because I think you know we are actually on this side. So hopefully we are on this side, right? all kind of different kind of people, uh, couples and Oh, people, young people, all that. Uh, and you know, that's the whole point of like cultivating a sense of community so that we can have this part and have that part. Instead of starting from there, like, I want to change the world and feeling like a loner, which is really sad. Um, so that's a message for, for, for the synaptic group. Um, uh, and this is the last note, just a big note um, I found, and like, the most important question that I've been asking myself since. Uh, maybe a few years ago, and that explained the internal transformation I had. There's this question by Einstein Is the universe a friendly place? Uh, it's, it's a question that we all have to ask ourselves at the end of the day. Um, <coughs> ask ourselves every day and every moment. Um, uh, it's just really the question that helps guide me through every action that I take in life. And with that, um, I just wanted to offer the last thing um, is that if you've ever been to a phase of your life where you don't see the point of living and you wonder what the hell you're doing in this world, in this life, and you felt wondering, you felt purposeless, which I'm sure would happen or already is happening to many of you, um, come talk to me. I've, I've kind of like been through some cycles of it, so I have some experience of like, okay, how to deal with that phase of not having a purpose. Um, and I can share a testimony from a friend, actually a friend just sent me an email yesterday. I have been thinking about, a lot about uh, what living a meaningful life actually means. And of course it doesn't mean feeling a great sense of purpose every moment. A lot of it is just trying the in-between, learning to love, to sweat, as you said on the other day. I told a friend, I told him that. So, it's not like changing the world, it's actually living day by day. Uh, so please hit me up if you ever want to chat about it. Um, and yeah, last, last, very last slide about uh, <laughs> questions. Uh, Synaptic uh, has been my favorite family where I am, uh, I'm allowed to ask people questions and I love to ask people this question. Um, 
but more, probably not today, but keep that in mind, some of the questions I found really beautiful. Why not be most beautiful? And what is the world you want the children to live in? Um, with, then that, the final quote. Um, the, the point is to leave everything. Leave the question now, perhaps then someday in the future, you will gradually, without even noticing it, leaping your way to the answer. It's a beautiful line by Ruka, a German poet that I really love and has been, um, may have a lot in when I go to the phase of not really knowing what I'm doing, just keep having the question. Um, with that, thank you so much. But how'd you get the idea? So that was a very tricky act to follow. Me, so you, it was a little difficult for me. But um, just to preface this, I approached the presentation as a way to kind of tell you a couple of things that I've been doing, and also just to show you kind of my journey through Tufts, what it's meant to me, and kind of how this community has fit into all of it. So I'll start off with my title: Finding My Epicenter of Eclectic Movement. Um, and as if you know me, you know I love alliteration, which is why that <laughs> is there. <laughs> so, just to start off, the first steps for Baby Jumbo. Um, I came to Tufts so excited. I left high school just so ready to get my head in the game and just kind of soak up all of these different clubs and classes. Um, I hadn't felt really challenged um, in my old school. Like I loved it, loved my community. But coming to Tufts and just seeing all of these ideas that were out there, all of these activities, it was just a lot. Um, and so for me, the first year was just a blur of just nonstop meeting people, going to events. I probably went to 30 GIMs. Um, and it was also a frustrating journey because as much as I kept trying things out, I, it was really difficult for me to figure out where I fit in within it. What was my, as we said, grand purpose? Um, what was my thing? Um, and that was a question that I'd been struggling with through high school. Uh, what did I want to do? Not just what did I want to major, but what did I want to get out of these four years? Um, and so I did not have that clear freshman year, which is why kind of I ended up in this group because I realized that I wasn't the only one. Um, and that was a question that a lot of people were having. Um, so, in an academic sense, what have I come up with in these four years? I didn't do a thesis, but I've just written a lot of papers. Um, and through each paper, I've learned a lot. Um, I've taken classes from religion to uh, sociology. Actually, my advisor is sociology, even though I'm an international relations major and history. Um, and so I actually like put them all in the folder of like the ones that I was most proud of or the ones that were more polished, not just like. Um, and I came up to like 30 or 40 and I'm like, still in you know, the finals period, so more to come. But I think that this just represents the kind of variety of things that I've been tackling. Um, everything from you know learning about the history of America's relationship, the United States relationship with Iran to um, writing a paper recently about French poetry. Um, and I think that really, for me, has been what my liberal arts education has been. It's just fusing these different interests and really having the opportunity to take these courses and meet my professors. Um, when I walk around campus and a professor says, hi, hey, Gianna, I still am so excited. I get, I'm like, hi, Professor Cohen, great to see you. Like, it's just a feeling of creating those personal relationships, not just with the students, but with the people who are up there teaching you, because they don't only have so much knowledge to teach, but they, they've really been a support system. And I think the biggest example of this was actually my history advisor. I had <coughs> always thought about being a history major. I'd always been taking history classes within the international relations program. But I was, I was like, I don't know if I'll be able to actually put it together. And then I went to talk to her my junior spring. Um, she was actually one of my, my history, Jean Kumben, history teacher for African history for a really long time, I don't really remember it. But um, she was like, oh, do you want me to be your advisor? I think you can do it. I didn't even ask her, and she just already said that to me. And it was just kind of giving me that helping hand um, that really made me take that step. Um, and that same advisor, this 
fall semester it was definitely a tough semester academically um, on the um, subject of words, words, words. Um, have you ever had a writer's block? Yeah. So that extended through the semester when all you're doing is writing is a kind of uh, a big struggle, especially because for me writing is a, a really huge part of my identity. Um, and it just, it's a really frustrating thing to feel like you can't do something that you theoretically think that you love to do. Um, and so I was, you know, struggling through that, but she really gave me that sense of you can do it if you have, as Queen said, if you have to take care of yourself. If you can't reach anything, it's going to be okay. And just permission to take a break. And I think that's been like kind of the theme for me this year. It's just permission to say no, permission to say yes, permission to say, you know, I'm, I'm just not up to it today. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. So, different activities. Um, TEDx Taps has been incredibly important to me, both because of the social community that it's created, but also because of the role that it allowed me to take on. I got to be a speaker coach, which was so cool because it basically meant I got to talk to people, which is what I like to do. Um, and I realized that talking to people actually can be something that you do, you know, and helping them work through their ideas. And, you know, the satisfaction of seeing my speaker present and like crafting his own whole conversations, talking, seeing him do it on stage and meeting his parents, I felt like a proud mother. And I was like, oh, you did it, you did it. <laughs> um, and, you know, I'll get to this later, but I think that was kind of the first realization of I really like this thing called education. Like, I really like this thing about being able to be a lending hand to someone, really being able to help them work through, through their ideas because through talking to people, you also learn about yourself and about, um, you know, it sounds cliche, but about how you can help others through just being there, being a bouncing board. Um, so in this role, I was a bouncing board, but I got a lot out of it. Epic. Um, there's a, for you who don't know, Snappy Scholars is an institute of global leadership, and one of their flagship programs is Epic. Um, and every year, so this year, the topic that I took part in last year was the future of Europe. And I mean, I could talk to you guys about it for like an hour, but it was really for me like an academic marathon. Um, <coughs> and it was really, I think, what I needed junior year. I didn't go abroad, so it was kind of like my own abroad experience. And I just delved into just pages and pages of readings. Um, we had four hour exams, we had to like learn basically what's happening in Europe, <coughs> the broad sense of the world. but. What was extremely satisfying I'm right now, um, was that we had different lectures every week and just getting to hear the perspective of all these academics and professionals who are not only studying, there was a lot of professors, but also doing things in the world and who have taken this information and actually applied it. It was really inspiring and just an incredible exposure to sort of what you can do after Tufts and how to use your knowledge. Um, and just really, I mean, it was a test of my patience, you know, of like being able to sit in a classroom for two and a half hours, it was a really restless person, so that was also a learning experience, but the community of people I met, um, and I think this is the same for Snapchat again, it's just people who wanted to push themselves a little bit farther, people who wanted to make something more of their test career, and um, being surrounded by that um, energy, was incredibly inspiring and just made the whole journey worth it. So what did I make? I, you know, I was coming to Synaptics and I was like, oh, I didn't really make a presentation, or really do a thesis, but kind of in the, in the sense of what have we produced. Um, in every class I've had different products for Epic, one of the things I wanted to do was research. Like everyone does this thing called research. I want to go out and do research. Um, so with two other friends, we decided to we wanted to do an examination of a comparative analysis of migration in Europe. This was when it's still the refugee uh, crisis is still happening, but it was when it really was escalating, and um, and so we thought that it was interesting because we were all from very different places in Europe, from Macedonia, Spain, and the Kingdom, had a very different relationship with um, how the refugee crisis was manifesting itself. Um, so we each did our own literature review of the policies that each country had. Um, that was my final like, project for my first semester of Epic. 
And then theoretically, our idea was we were going to go into the world and we were going to interview people and kind of gather this information. I got to do two or three interviews with some academics in Spain. We came back and then life got in the way and you know, speaking of failure, the research process, uh, project kind of fell through. But some huge takeaways were the process of applying to do research through the whole IRB thing, which I didn't know about. <laughs> uh, working with others, uh, getting an idea and putting it through. And then even if it doesn't work, what can you get out of it? So even though we didn't do the research, we did learn a lot about the issue, and we did present it in the EPIC um, conference, and that was really rewarding. And at the end of my second semester um, of EPIC, what I did was like a visual uh, project. So these are some of my artwork talking about kind of the issues, and there's a whole reflection piece of why I did what I did, but that was my kind of final project. Um, so after EPIC, um, last summer, I did my first kind of real internship that related to my interest or to what I thought was going to be my next step. I worked at the Council on Foreign Relations, which is a think tank in Washington, D.C. I was under the Independent Task Force, which is a department that puts out, kind of like discourse actually, a report every couple of semesters, I would say, or like once or twice a year, on an issue that is prevalent in the world. So the last one they came out with was the Arctic, <coughs> the issue of the Arctic and kind of all the, and it, it relates to foreign, um, the United States foreign, um, really foreign relations interest. Um, so it was Arctic, and they were also doing another one in North Korea. So I did a lot of busy work, but it was really awesome. Like the second week I was there, like Paul Ryan was like in the building. I was like, oh my god, I'm in DC. This is normal. Like everyone in DC who's a celebrity is a politician or something. And first time in the Capitol, so it was it was first time I was alone, living alone, making a city my own. Um, doing an internship that I had gone on myself, you know, I applied to a ton of places, got accepted by some, denied by a lot, or just didn't get a reply from a lot. <laughs> I think that's a common experience. And so just the feeling of like having this like tangible task that I could accomplish in the summer was incredibly rewarding. And the people that I met, both from Tufts, surprisingly, had an incredible community in DC. But also my bosses like, were saying, "Don't build, don't burn bridges." I still want to keep in touch with my supervisor, and just all these names sound so fancy, and like all these jobs sound so formal. But then when you get there, like they're all people getting your work out there, written or visual, because it takes a lot of courage if you write something original. And I haven't written any of these pieces. This is just like my artwork, and then this is just embarrassing. I did. Um, Freshman year, I was in her campus, I don't know if you guys know this. Um, yeah, yeah, I went through my friends there. But the reason that, what I got from that experience is, you know, I've never written a blog in my life. But the fact that I got to be published as a freshman was incredibly empowering, even if it was writing about, like, you know, winter skincare routines, you know, like it was very simple material, but it was on the web and people were reading it and people were reading my work. Um, and that made me realize, I mean, I came into Tufts and was like, oh, the English major. Then I realized that I have this internal struggle with writing that <laughs> may, might not make it a good thing to be an English major. But the satisfaction of like sharing your work is really important because, you know, at the end of the day, you're producing for yourself, but also to transmit it to other people and to share it. And personally, I love talking to people. That's kind of my main medium of expression. But writing and arts are close seconds. So how does this all tie to synaptics, which is why we're here today? Um, I joined synaptics, well, I interviewed, I still remember my interview with Sam Barry, I don't know if you guys know him. And I was so excited. Uh, I was like, yeah, this is going to be just such a fulfilling group. And it really has been. Um, it hasn't been in the formal sense of, you know, I've created a product, I like, went to Kenyon, I did research. But it has been in the sense that it's been a form of mentorship and a, and a cushion through my academic and personal career at Tufts. Because I've been surrounded by people who are engaged and who check in with me, both at a personal level, um, and they just they see things in a very similar way. And just to have that space, because I know there's a lot of people at Tufts who have that capacity of introspection, but to have a space that really permits you to have those kind of conversations, is really special. Um, 
So these are a couple of our group photos. It's really hard to find some group photos, so we're really out of color right now. <laughs> but um, I wanted to point this out because I think that for Synaptics, it's been, there's been frustrations because I think that it has been difficult to be in a group that's so individual, but then works as a collective, you know, and to have this sort of sense of wanting to do something, but without a clear idea of what, what we want to do at an individual level and at a group level. I'm super trembling right now, I'm sorry. Um, so one of my memories from this group is sophomore, was it sophomore year? Sophomore year was the snow Armageddon. That's the reason it's stuck in my mind. And we were kind of having a crisis of like, where is this group going? Some of the juniors had left, and um, one of our main projects was like, we really want to get fireside chats going, which is this sort of like round table conversation. And it gave me such an insight about group collaboration and leadership, of how to allocate responsibilities, how to see who can step up, when you step up, when your role is to just listen, and your role is to contribute. So to me, Synaptics, one of the main things I've gotten from it is this lesson of leadership, you know, of what is leadership, what is group activity, what is teamwork. Because um, we're all a team and we all have you know, a common goal, which is to, to do things and to be great, to be the best we can. So that, to me, like at a broad scale, I got a lot from, from having the opportunity to be able to step up with Synaptics. And then, what else that is, what has the college been? And the college has been a fun ride. I have, I think, I don't know, everyone has a different experience with this space, um, this community. But I can just say that I, I feel just incredibly privileged to have been able to be here for four years because the kind of people you meet, at the end of, at the, end of the day, it's all about the people. But you take a step out of this campus, and it's really hard to have the conversations that you're having with everyone around you. It's just a level of, like, of creativity, of passion, of perseverance and determinants, and just fun. Like I think I would go to other campuses, and they might be really interesting, they might be really intellectual, but this like balance of being able to like, okay, I'm gonna work in the library till like 12 a.m., but then I'm gonna go out and have fun and dance and just like have my own life and have that balance. To me, that's incredibly important, and I think that it's really seen on this campus. So I'm very thankful. And what is my next step? Um, so I know I've probably been going too long, but basically, I realized this year that I wanted to do something. I didn't want to go to a nine to five job where I didn't really see the purpose of what I was doing. I really feel like one of the things that has been lacking in my life has been this contact, this on the ground work with people. Um, and so I realized through some volunteer work I've been doing that I really love kids. Um, and I always knew that, but I, when thinking what my thing is, I, I really care about education because I've had the privilege of having a great education and it's been so powerful and impacting my life. Um, so I kind of had no idea, I kind of fell into this, but I'm going to be doing Teach for America, for anyone who doesn't know, it's this two-year program where you go into low-income communities and teach um, anything from elementary to high school. So I will be in Miami next year, and if anyone is visiting or wants to visit, please let me know, because I would love to see some family faces. Um, but yeah, uh, just to wrap it up, uh, I want to say Synaptics has been an incredibly important part of my TUFS career. Um, and I really appreciate all of any moment that I have with you guys individually or collectively because it's, you know, it's definitely left us smart. So, thank you, and I hope to see you this next week. Uh, so, I'm Sean. Sean Chapman, senior this year. Uh, can't wait to leave, but that being said, I mean, obviously TUFS is a great place. Um, what I wanted to say today was just essentially, like, when I came to the school, uh, I wouldn't say I was the most cynic person in the world, but I was definitely up there. Like, <laughs> I came from, like, a low-income family, low socioeconomic class, came from a pretty racist part of Florida where, like, so racist that it essentially affected, like, the Hispanic side of my identity. Um, like, had close family members pass away, a bunch of stuff. And I came here, and... I felt like it was going to be a change of pace in terms of, I, like, obviously this is like, it's 
places like the Paragon of Social Justice, uh, just like at the forefront of so many different good things that people are trying to do in the world. And uh, nothing really, in my mind, I, I, at first nothing really changed and it took me a while to realize this, uh, especially through synaptics and specifically talking to Kuyan because he's like the, the oh, optimist. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and it literally comes to the point where it's just like your viewpoint on life. Um, I mean, you're, you can basically be in any environment you want to be in and you're going to see whatever you want to see. Um, and if you just have a very negative viewpoint, you're going to pick those those aspects of life out and vice versa. And I mean, like I, by extension, I mean, it's just like generally applicable to all life. I mean, I think a lot of people, if they don't sell their environment short, they sell themselves short. And I just, another kind of just point I wanted to make was that there's no such thing as talent. There's only self-efficacy. It's only how well you think that you can do something. And like Kuyan was saying, you just got to go out and do it sometimes. Um, I mean, that's hard to do nowadays, considering, I mean, there's a lot of ideas people out there, but not as many doers. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, that's kind of all I wanted to say. I mean, synaptics, like, for me, that was, that was the biggest takeaway for me, like, just seeing so many people that had these amazing passions and just, like, goals for their life that they wanted to do that I originally thought just might have been, like, silly and just, like, not realistic, and I realize that as soon as you close that door, then it's going to stay closed and there's no opportunity whatsoever for change of progress. So, yeah. Thanks. So, I like, like in my old age, I'm thinking about like, what's, the, what's in ethics? Um, he's like, man, that's everything pretty much. Um, and I think when I like, when I think back to like my favorite moments, it's hearing Hearing about different people's lives, life in this organization, and how you just like you know it's it's a microcosm of tough, so you just don't really know the talent you're surrounded by and the and the beautiful minds until until you do, um, and that's been like the greatest joy for me here. Um, the mentorship, the friendship, the people who give <coughs> me crazy ideas um, and pointed me down different paths that I would never take. Um, so on that, I'm actually going to tell a story that um, that has less to do with synaptics and more just to do with, with my life and where my head has been for the past year and a half. Um, and the title is the ultimate title for 10x Tufts, actually. Um, we, this was something we, um, through 10x Tufts, which I've been involved in organizing my, my, most of my time here, um, we, we were doing some like, idea generation, and I just heard this, I just heard this 99% Invisible podcast about um, about the anthrosphere, which is apparently the layer of um, the layer of material under human civilization that is sort of the newest the newest geologic layer, and will be something that that will be permanently added to the um, to the Earth's surface in a way that is productive, because they're they're sort of theorizing that this will be something that will always be underneath us, but it will it will be able to provide us resources too. Like you could mine it for for copper and metal. You could. You could, you know, process it for different things, um, and so I was like, guys, like, what if we explore this? Like, what is, what is, what more is there to explore? Um, like, underneath our feet. I'm not a geologist, mm -hmm. um, but I guess this this story really starts with the river. Um, this is a picture of the Green River in Utah, um, and it's a river that I grew up going to pretty much every year with my with my dad, who's a um, fly fisherman. Um, we drive six hours from Denver here. Um, and like there's there's so much for me growing up in Colorado. There's a lot of like like facts and mythology and stuff that I had to know. Like like on which side of the pond will divide are we? Is the water going to the Pacific? Is it going to the Atlantic? Um, where did the tributaries go? All this sort of stuff that that was just so important to the people that I that I grew up around. Um, and I knew that this river um, started started behind a dam, um, also part of the Sphere, our way of storing water, um, and ended at the Colorado River Delta, which looks like this now. Um, it does not reach the um, the Salton Sea, or not, not um, the Sea of Cortez anymore. I've never been here. I don't think many people have. Um, but you could say that, that that entire watershed is being is being perfectly efficiently allocated to human use um, because it does not reach anymore. But there are so many pros and cons to that, and so many pros and cons that, that from an environmental standpoint, you can see like dams are bad, 
draining wet um, watersheds and all this is really bad, but also when you grow up in, in the American West, like you under, like I, I was I was very much I understood that that we wouldn't civilization wouldn't exist out there without dams um, or any of these any of these major human systems in place. Um, so I was thinking about this, and I also started taking GIS for the very first time. Um, and GIS is really cool. If you haven't, if you don't know what it is, um, it's basically like analysis through um, through cartography. Um, and these were like the first maps I made of the city of Denver, and I was like, oh, like I was like, wow, I can see, I can see so many things about this this one place just by sort of parsing out what is important and what I and what I want to know. Um, so through there, I started. I was really at that point doing a lot of um, doing a lot of like urban studies or planning work. Um, I I've gone through four majors in my time at Tufts, so I like was pretty. Pretty meandering, and that was this was something that really was like yes, like this is this is really cool um, to be able to take take all of these things about a about a landscape and bring it and and bring it to something that will t that will tell you about where to go in the future um, and what and what a framing of a curve condition. Um, so from there, I I found myself. Um, last summer at the Harvard Graduate School of Design um, in their landscape architecture program. Um, I, I like made a major decision when I was applying to summer programs and applied to landscape architecture instead of planning. Um, so I was doing a lot of stuff like this, you know, like right. making making models, making contour lines, a lot of like landscapey stuff, um, making plans. Um, and it was getting sort of, I, I was getting a lot of, of what I needed there. Um, I think I think to throughout you know sort of my sophomore junior year at Tufts, I I become really really stuck in really in really needing to to push myself to do everything and to and to be good at everything and not and not ever feeling like I was adequate, which it sort of sounds like most people who go through college feel at some point. Um, and I just like even with all that work that I was doing, it, it was like it was like where am I going? Why is any of this useful? Um, but my advisor, who who's like really a near and dear person in my heart, she actually did she did her landscape thesis on Grand Junction, Colorado, and I just like was so obsessed with her. She um, it was towards the it was towards the final project, and and I was sort of toying with this idea of like okay, like like viewing viewing like like the editing of of land and of the environment and like filling <coughs> in that sort of stuff is is inherently harmful. It's a scar on the earth. Mm. And she was like she was like, well okay, that's a way to frame it. But it's also not. But it also, you know, there's so much there's so much sort of layering and human growth that happens around that and things that, that we need to survive. Um, so towards the end, oh Wait, I want to do this one first. Um, so, so this was like I was like brainstorming for my final project. Um, our goal was to was to work in this this area of South Boston, um, near like sort of near Dorchester. It's by um, it's by the Old Harbor, which has a little beach, um, and just like do something, like make an intervention in some way. Um, and so I was like I was like okay, like like highway birds and linear stuff and like I don't even know. Um, and some other people were, were working on sea level rise data, which I thought was a really interesting way to, to start to see geography. Um, because what it does is it sort of takes, it's like someone has put a watercolor onto, um, onto, onto an urban area and been like, all oh, this, this is not going to be here in a, in a period of time that is, is, is rational to us. And that is, that really, you know, we, we need to care about. So I was doing this work at the same time reading this book. Um, and the beginning of this book is this section is this piece called Atchafalaya on the Mississippi River and how upstream upstream of the Mississippi um, near Baton Rouge um, there is a place where the river is damped so that it stays flowing out the out the current delta through New Orleans and if it wasn't dammed it would have switched it would have uh, about 50 years ago it would have totally switched watersheds into the watershed next to it. Um, it's, a, it's an alluvial delta, and it just the sediment moves so rapidly. Um, and so, without without the human intervention, New Orleans wouldn't exist. New Orleans still shouldn't exist. And what and what happens to New Orleans um, 
is is sort of a a, a feature of of this like of this really like you know our, our need to, our need to preserve heritage and our need to preserve place at the cost of at the cost of many in that place, um, but also that need coming in this very um, what I see is like very mechanical, very surgical, like concrete walls all over in levees. Um, so I read that, read that, and I was like, oh my god, like, like, what about a seawall? What if we start thinking about seawalls? Um, and this is something that I don't think anyone wants to think about across <coughs> their across the beaches in their city. Mm -hmm. That you'll need to build to build a seawall to prevent anthropogenic climate change from affecting your city. But in Boston, um, because of how the geography is is laid out and because of the geology, um, seawalls are a very good solution to preventing um, to preventing um, the sort of flooding related to, to sea level rise. So I was like, all right, like I want to build a seawall. My advisor was like, you, you can't, you can't build a wall. Like, don't, don't build, like, don't, don't build the wall and have that be your project. And so I was like, okay, okay, I'm not gonna build a wall. Um, other people should learn from that too. Um, and so I was like, okay, what if, what if we think about like where the wall would be? Should it need to be built in some way in the future? And build a park around that um, as a way to engage with climate futures. Um, so this was my this is my project. Um, starting to think about like like how can we think about about like futures of the Anthropocene and anthropogenic climate change mm -hmm. in space in a way that's didactic and oh this is the site and the map the blue is, is what would flood with six foot with six feet of, of climate change which we're going to see around um, like 120 150 years from now. Um, so this is this is my design, and the entire thing is supposed to be, you know, how does this how does this land change um, over time? How do you you know you you have you have it in its current state, and then as water rises, um, things deteriorate, things die, but but the community is right there at every point, um, living with that destruction, um, which is something that that became really. Really, really juicy to me as someone who's interested in um, in 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 the practice of like memory preserving and building in landscape. Um, so I did that. Um, really, really got a lot out of that. Wanted to continue with it for my capstone, um, and I sort of had this opportunity where I was like, okay, I could I could continue to do sea level rise design in, in Boston because it's 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 here. Or I could really challenge myself and um, and and choose a different location just because <coughs> the, the conditions for working with sea level rise are so different depending on where you, depending on where you are. So I was like, okay, Florida, um, and Florida is really unique in that um, based upon the the geology, um, it's not going to be like a like a spilling over the. Um, spilling over the walls kind of thing, it's going to be bubbling, and it already does bubble up through people's lawns because it's completely porous. So there's no building seawalls to save, to save Miami. Um, went to the Everglades, which are, are just a surreal place that, um, that are going to be gone. Um, it should the climate futures be true, um, because even though sea levels will rise, the, there's there will be no protecting the, the unique ecological things going on there. Um, made more maps, made more maps, because um, that's sort of, it just became a way of thinking for me. And then started design, same sort of contour, like, people will, will live with this. And what was really important to me was to bring it to a privileged space in Miami, um, not to a, actually not be, not be designing in a place with a higher percentage of, of low income people, and with a higher percentage of people of color, because it is people from privileged backgrounds who are who are contributing the most to these factors of anthropogenic climate change. So if they've got the money to do a waterfront renovation, let's do this right here and let's let's show them over time. Um, I did that poor stuff, poor design stuff, um, and throughout all of this, I I really like. I think what what like what started to happen is I started to like 
break away. When you first come to when you first come to to, um, to university, there's like you write a lot. You write a lot of papers, right? Or you do a lot of problem sets, depending on which side of the stem you may be saying it's like papers, problem sets. Um, <laughs> but there are like there are many different ways to think. Um, and this community, Synaptic Scholars, opened that up for me in a huge way. Where I saw I saw people um, like Tim McDonald, who's who's like who's one of my biggest mentors and friends, do be a biologist, but also be be wanting to do biomimicry design with the biology and to start to think, you know, could we add the work that the, the presentation we did was so graphic and so so illustrative of like of like different ways of thinking. Um, that everything that was happening here was like was like, okay, I can I can start to play play with materials in a way that I never could before. Um, and that's also continued into, into other sort of work that I'm doing. Still work that, that really has to do with, with climate change and with landscape. Um, and to me, it's just ways of, of like representing my identity in the West. Um, mm -hmm. wow. Like, what does, what does the, the, the digital modeling of the, of the view look like compared to how, it, how it's experienced? Um, you know, can we think of different ways to do topography that are not just um, building models on top of it? Um, and can we start? Can we sort of start to use ingredients of reality, of real data, um, to build fictions that are that are equally didactic? In what they mean. This one. This one was sort of my like my my final piece for the semester um, that I titled Re Reclamation and Suspension. Um, after the Bureau of Reclamation, which, um, which took, which basically like, um, like sh the, the American West would not be what it is today without the Bureau of Reclamation in good and bad ways. Because the Bureau of Reclamation is built every single dam, hundreds and now like pretty much a thousand dams in the American West. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't want to think about that. And um, sort of, a larger after this like, year and a half long journey that like I like totally when I was being my junior year when I was being sophomore and freshman year would never <coughs> see myself in doing any of this work, um, which which I guess sort of speaks to the fact that that like you can't you totally like you can plan your life and you should plan your life, yeah. um, but your plan is not is not going to go as, as it as you think it is. Um, and even now I'm starting to question like do I want to do landscape architecture? Um, would I rather be working with, with climate science um, or working on the ground in communities? Um, and unfortunately, I'm actually going to have the, um, the, the ability to do that this year back in Colorado with the, um, with the Continental Divide Trail Coalition. Um, I'm going to be doing um, cartography, mapping, um, <coughs> conservation work, and trail design for them. Um, and it's this trail that goes it's one of the big three. It's it's this one, the Pacific the Pacific Crest Trail, and the Appalachian Trail mm -hmm. that are the big three um, continental trails. Um, and this one is the longest, the hardest because all of it is about <coughs> five thousand foot elevation and the and the least height. Um, and to me, this this like area here, like the more the more that I think about like I think about land and I think about you know just the layering of stuff that we do to it, um, the more that I like want to be working in a place that that I like, like I not only grew up in, but I I really in, within my own sort of whatever you have cultural conscience, I recognize that that like the impact of of Western Western settlement mm -hmm. here and the impact of the erasure of indigenous history, but also the impact of, of you know, what, what a system like this can actually mean for, for natural preservation, even though it's just a trail. It could mean an entire natural corridor that is going to be protected, um, owing so much to humans and to animals and to the preservation of so many of these watersheds. Um, once I go to the Atlantic, once I go to the Pacific, and that Colorado River Delta. Um, 
so yeah, that's that's one project. I did a lot at Tufts too. Um, also, this is this is me. I think close to that trail. I'm actually not mm -hmm. sure. Um, I I possibly have never hiked that trail, before, mm -hmm. um, but I I will. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Is there any any questions, thoughts? Uh, yeah, I was, just, I was just amazed by how you know, people could do so many different things. <laughs> it's, so, it's so amazing that in my world, like, people are the, like, not like going out of nature. So it's so refreshing just to hear, hey, this is your world, which is full of nature and making math. And I'm thinking of that, whenever I thought of map, I always think about the map for human development. And for you, it's a very different kind of map. But the concept is similar, right? Attaching certain concept to some part of reality. Which yeah, and, cool. and about framing the world in a way that, yeah. that will help it. And also, like, I don't really even hide that much myself. I just like, it's my least favorite of outdoor things to do, but I just like really, I really love this place. Wow. Um, but also, like, like it is funny because this is one very specific story. Like, I think all of us have different things that we can talk about as like projects. Yeah. Um, so this is mine. Yeah. I realize it could be quite an unfamiliar face to some of you. I'm Cynthia. Um, I was abroad all the last year, and then this year I've been very and what I'm going to present to you guys here, which was my thesis um, called Anime Wong, the actress who died a thousand deaths. I'm not sure if anyone, I know some people here saw it, so I hope it's not too repetitive. Um, but I think in lieu of uh, kind of everyone else who presented, I think. One thing was not is definitely such a good storyteller. And so one of these things, or just you know, us telling stories, making narratives of our college careers, making narratives of our lives, you know, all of this is storytelling. And I came today kind of quite unprepared in the sense of I'm still kind of reeling from this experience that was less than a week ago, and I'm kind of in a very kind of mystical state of mind right now, kind of trying to keep the post-show blues away. Um, yeah, and so I'm going to talk about it's kind of storytelling. So. Um, this one project was a live cinema theater piece, which um, about the life and works of Anna Mae Wong, who was the first Asian American actress to make it in Hollywood in the 1920s. And so, kind of what drew me to her story, kind of what Nathaniel touched upon a lot of it, is kind of from my own family experience. Like, what is diaspora? What does it mean to be, you know, have two foot, like, to have feet in two worlds, but also feel at home at none? And um, so Anna Mae Wong, she was an Asian American actress, so she's a third generation Asian American. Um, grew up in Los Angeles, but no matter what she did, she was always regarded as a Chinese actress in America. So she was infamous for playing roles like the Ch Dra uh, Dragon Lady, China Doll. So basically, you know, the evil Chinese woman who, you know, kills everybody. Or the China Doll who's like submissive and like falls in love with a white man and then commits suicide. <laughs> so she, so for the longest time, the Asian community, uh, like in the P POC community, didn't really want to acknowledge her. She's kind of a taboo because she represented these really painful images that they had. It wasn't until like her centennial about 20 years ago that people were like, okay, let's reevaluate her legacy. Because, like, because people were like, oh, it's not as simple as she took these stereotypical roles and she was complicit in racism. It wasn't so simple. But um, at the same time, so she wasn't at home in America because all of the racism that she faced. And then at one point in her life, she's like, okay, what if I go to China? Like maybe I am a Chinese actress. And so she ends up going to China and then she's hated by everyone in China as well. Not everyone, but a big portion of people because she's kind of torn between two national agendas. In the West, she was torn by Orientalism. You know, people wanted, had these images of the East and like, it to help them both promote kind of, or like justify what they were doing in the East, you know, colonialism and everything. But when she went to China, she was used as a nationalist propaganda because China was trying to modernize in a very Western sense. And they saw her as being a bad name, like giving a bad name for the Chinese people, and also saw her as like a representation of the old China, the exotified China, which they didn't want to be. They wanted to be you know, industrial and modern. And so she's kind of torn between these two really big political and systematic kind of pressures, but also having a very personal connection to it, because that affected everything from her interpersonal lives, her identity. Um, and so I wanted to explore this through art, because that's kind of the primary way I found that I express myself or express ideas. They're locked in. Um, yeah. So one thing that really interested me was not just her story of you know, representation and misrepresentation, but also how has her story been told already. And so from basically from when there's a revival of anime one works, 
um, many academics have tried to tackle this issue. And at first it was very much like, at first she was like a sinner, and then all of a sudden she's a saint, and people were like, oh, she's amazing, you know, she gave so much dignity to her roles, you know, everyone was just racist. And I think there's it's somewhere very caught in between. She was a very calculating woman. She knew when to do what, but she also, she was no longer, she was no, she's not just the victim or the villain of her story. And it's just interesting to see how people have crafted it, or crafted these stories around her. So some people like to say, it's like, oh, first she was American. And then she was, she wasn't American. And then she went to China, but she wasn't Chinese. And then, addition, she became Asian American. <laughs> but, you know, that journey really wasn't so simple because Asian American didn't exist as a term until the 60s. And she existed in the 20s. So what was it for her, like for her to pave her own path? Something that was really hybrid. And she existed in this weird zone where, you know, there wasn't the language to talk about it, but in some ways she embodied it so much in her work already. Um, so yeah, so kind of this got me thinking, like, how do I want to tell her story? You know, people have written papers, have written, there's this play already written about her that I really didn't like because I felt like it victimized her, didn't give her, give her any agency. The last line of the, the play was basically, you can play any role that you want when you're dead. And so I was like, I wasn't really happy with that. But she has like she kind of jokes. She has she has a great sense of humor. Her joke. She used to joke to people like, Oh, I on my tombstone is she right? I'm the actress who died a thousand deaths because she'd always have a diary for movies, either by being killed or committing suicide because she could never have that happy ending as what she called Oriental woman at the time. Um, so I was like, Okay, so how do we tell her story? Um, and I realized I didn't want to use kind of conventional means of storytelling because I feel like it didn't fit her. She was an actress who did theater work, who did radio shows, who did film. It's like, how do you encompass a life that is so rich? And so I started looking beyond kind of, because my, my main um, sort of art expression is film. So I was like, okay, uh, the obvious would be like, let's make a short documentary about her. That has also been done. And I'm like, that, I feel is enough to encompass this kind of really complex issue. So I started looking into other ways of storytelling, ones that aren't necessarily a hero's journey, you know, very classic Western Hollywood cinema. And so that's how I came, came upon this idea of live cinema theater. So what is live cinema theater? It's basically having a film set. Let's see. I'm not the first person to do it, but there's, you know, everyone has, so far people have done, have done it for very different purposes. <coughs> so what it is, is having live, uh, cameras live on stage filming what is being acted on stage and then projecting it live on screen. It's a very loose term, it's not an official theater term or film term yet, but there's two prominent, prominent actors, uh, artists who have done it. One is Katie Mitchell, who used it, she liked the close-up of theater. She always talked about how in theater you keeps everyone so far away, like how do you bring an audience more intimately into a theater while still being to see the whole structure. Mm -hmm. So that's why Katie Mitchell did it. Wong Chung did it because he felt that like you can see how it would how you can craft an image on stage. And so why I used it was kind of a combination of both. So I used it not only to recreate some of her movies, so we recreated some film scenes of hers on stage, but also because the way that I kind of approach her life was through her memories. So this is kind of a, this is not a linear story. It takes place after she gets really drunk one night because Anna Wong was an alcoholic towards the end of her life. Um, she gets drunk one night and then she starts hallucinating about her memories filming this movie, Daughter of the Dragon. Mm -hmm. And through filming these movies, she starts recalling and the different people in her life start coming in and out because her, and she kind of questions whether or not her life is going to end up like her movies. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of parallels that you can draw between her life and her movies and how they, but also exploring how they diverge. Um, and so I can show you a few clips of... <laughs> show the audience something that they can't really see on stage. So just by positioning the camera differently, like mm -hmm. here you can't see the front of her face, but with the camera, the audience can simultaneously experience this part of the stage while also seeing the face of the older animal. Oh, sorry, I should have prefaced. So also kind of the, stru the structure I looked at was having an older anime Wong view her past life. Like, so she, there, there exists both an older anime Wong and a younger anime Wong. She's the oldest, we kind of see the story from the older anime wall reflecting back. So this is the older anime wall over here, and the younger one over here. Um, and we, we, we can it real quick. Where is the audience? The audience, sorry, the audience is sitting here. So it's like a proscenium theater. It's like a mm -hmm. half, half circle. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> See you soon, Father. 
this is kind of in her memory space, her viewing this film as young, when she was younger.
was one of the things that I loved about synaptics, which was this interdisciplinary aspect where like all of us came from come from different backgrounds and we talk about it and we create things and there's some sort of synergy that just happens. And I feel like this moment, like this project, I mean, they weren't that different as I would say most of them, are I feel like why haven't they actually collaborated earlier on? Because they're all in the arts. But yeah. you know, I think it created this interdisciplinary thing that wasn't really here at that point and it was only possible because of all these amazing like 30 something people worked on this project to make it happen we had people from boston actors from boston people locally not just the tufts community which is beautiful um yeah i just i guess i kind of i want i guess i kind of want to wrap this up just saying about you know like i think what everyone said before you know being bold and being willing to think outside the box and connecting dots that might not seem as obvious and I think this kind of project really helped me realize that um, and also just like the people that you meet here are so important they support you through so much like uh, I had so much anxiety going to this more self-doubt I started taking lorazepam for those who don't know it's like anxiety meds I called her Laura I'm like oh no, I'm nervous Laura keeps me calm <laughs> <laughs> and so you know I mean whether it's like things that you just there's so much support and love here, and people are really interested in new old ideas. So you know, keep you know, don't burn the bridges. Like here and say, you know, keep those people close, and they are the ones who like give life to these things. I mean, the show, I mean, stories. On the note of stories, like I think sometimes you know, you tell stories for yourself and everything, but at the same time, the story wouldn't be much without an audience. And so, so much of the show is also made because people wanted to hear these stories. Um, I don't know where I'm going with this, but. Um, I guess, let me see. Yeah, I think one thing I just learned is, you know, in the note of connecting dots and everything, I think that process is a very, can feel very lonely and it's a very confusing one. I think then the best way to deal with it is to be okay with being lost. Because I don't think you'll ever not be lost. I think that's something that, you know, it's hard to achieve. And I think a few people really achieve that. And so it's not about, necessarily having to find something, but just being okay with being lost. And again, Rebecca Solnit has this beautiful line. Um, it's, to be lost is to be fully present. And to be fully present is to be capable of being an, an uncertainty and mystery. And one does not get lost but loses oneself, with the implication that it is a conscious choice, a, cho a chosen surrender. And so I just want to thank like, people here in Synaptics and for just like making me feel like it's okay to be lost. And, also, all of us being reveled and being lost together. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, um, as I guess everyone talked about futures, my future is very unclear right now. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be on a film shoot for the rest of June. I'm going to be production designing. Go home for two months, and then I'm moving to New York with no job. <laughs> so if anyone wants to be in New York, come with me. I'm going to do the stereotypical starving artist and see if I can make it to the game. <laughs> Um, it's more of a statement. I just so I, I got to see this uh, be performed live, uh, and I left seeing how experimental it was, and I didn't know how much of it was thought, how much thought had gone into that process, mm -hmm. and to, have, to hear you talk about this and to hear how this project is unfurled is actually incredible. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that she like, I do think that Anna Maywell like was in your dreams and she like spoke to you. <laughs> I, and that spiritual moment, I'm like, yeah, you're cosmically destined to have to tell the story. <laughs> but also, I think that you're reading your author's note also about how you chose to tell the story is also powerful. So the quote by Viola Bio Davis in her own interview uh, was about yeah. choosing to exhume, rather than having to create new stories, tell honest, tell stories of the people who never got to live out their dreams. And I think you've done an incredible job at, at, at doing that. Well, thank you. It's an incredible piece of very <laughs> Actually, just to give Viola Davis credit, like this quote is beautiful. If, no one, if you guys didn't watch the Oscars, you should go just watch Viola Davis accept the speech. She got an Oscar for that speech in itself. Um, it's this, you know, there's one place that all the people with the greatest potential are gathered, and that's the graveyard. People ask me all the time, what kind of stories do you want to tell Viola? And I say, exhume those bodies, exhume those stories, the stories of people who dreamed big and never saw those dreams to fruition, people who fell in love and lost. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, this also I'll be editing this and the recording will come out at, in a month or so if people want to see it. Um, 
So hi everyone, um, my name is Jonath Chukunde, I will teach again and uh, I was, I'm very excited, I guess I'm here to just be grateful for what Synaptics has done for me and like the people that I have met and the dream that kind of um, has taken me through uh, through Synaptics or through my life in Tufts and the main reason why I wanted to share this is because as much as I haven't been at Synaptics uh, for every single thing, it made me write down, my application to Synaptics made me write down what I wanted to do in life, mm -hmm. what, I, what I wanted to, what I envisioned, what I loved. And through that space, I was able to like explore and like think, exchanging ideas with people. And I remember my application was about women empowerment and especially in developing countries. So, places where they are very disadvantaged and all through my life uh, at Tufts I have been able to like create that and like actually visualize it using all my studies for I'm a computer science major and a poli sci minor and like those two always have always done at least something to do with women and like how can I bring this change and I feel like it's from synaptics that I was able to develop that like, that idea and that's why I just wanted to say that I'm very grateful for this program and um, also just the intellectual uh, conversations that we had with everyone throughout that time. It's To me it was really great to just meet uh, a group of people that I guess sometimes it's so hard to just uh, go out there and find just people talking about all different things, random topics, their interests and everything. But like synaptics really gave me that space to like think outside the box as well from uh, what everyone, what Cindy was saying and um, just meeting all of you lovely people and for me today I think reflecting back that has been a journey and I'm really grateful to have been a part of synaptics and for that person who really believed in me and thought this is a synaptic scholar and yeah. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to say to the seniors that are going and everyone else, keep dreaming and keep dreaming and keep doing what you love to do. I mean that's what will take you further and further. And at the same time like never lose who you are. I guess that's where I have learned over the time and just believe in yourself, believe in your dreams. And with that, you're gonna go further and further. And I want to applaud everyone for doing all the great things that you've done, from TEDx to QN doing all of those um, group <laughs> meetings <laughs> to I don't know everything. I'm sure to your project, the psychology. I remember you talking about it. I'm sure it was fun. I can't remember what else. To Zobia, all the great work that you're doing with Comsci and everything. Those are just from my class, the people that I remember and you've really all been very inspirational to me and this group was has been great. And even in my absence I always feel bad <laughs> about missing the meetings, but you too, I guess we all understand the work that we have. But um yeah. And was that it? People were sharing my future plans. Oh uh, so as part of what also I guess synaptics kind of put in me. Synaptics also helped me um, provided funding for me during one of the one of my summers where I was able to do like an internship back in Kenya at the startup. That really helped me build my technical skills and my technical career and um, which I'm very grateful for. And for my future I will be working I will be working for Deutsche Bank, which is just doing course stuff, technology. And at the same time, I have a project. I also got um, a grant, Davis Peace Prize, that I will be working on. Uh, I will be doing um, women empowerment projects. So it's a combination of technology, education, women empowerment, and like also bringing together the aspect of Islam and peace into the project and so I will be going to Niger in for one month in June to, to work on the project and what I will be doing is designing and actually looking into ways in which technology can be used um, 
to improve the curriculum in um, for a rural school. It's a elementary and secondary school in Nigeria, and also there's women who are involved in the school, and they always come there to like study uh, and learn like learn about their rights because there's this woman who's uh, doing a lot of work with that, and I will be working with her uh, on that project, and so like. Bringing just my technical aspect, my um, women empowerment uh, project as well. I was really happy and I know I was sharing it with Kay and I was like, yeah, I'm really happy. This is what I wrote in Synaptics, uh, my Synaptics application. And right now, somehow, it's now like actually coming to life. And I'm very excited for that opportunity. So yeah, that's what I will be doing. So working on designing and creating uh, technology computers a, a computer center so designing a computer center for this women's and uh, elementary school and secondary school um, education and seeing ways in which to integrate with the curriculum and yeah and doing other things I I will also be working with my startup so it's just that's that's just part time but yeah Great. Yeah, it's been great. <laughs> and congratulations <laughs> to everyone. I'm really proud of you, all of you guys. I hope to see you sometime, for yeah. sure. And on Facebook or wherever. Let's keep in touch. I know you're all going to go places. Pass my great uh, regards to uh, what's his name now? the founder of Agile. Oh, Sherman. Sherman. <laughs> Sherman. <laughs> and everyone else that is in the department and yeah thank you so much yeah mm -hmm.